Take a person, take a story, take you on a journey. It's your take. Today's guest has done many different things over the course of her life and career. She was a police detective, has worked in broadcasting, and remembered fondly for her 16-year tenure on the BBC programme Crime Watch, where she worked with Nick Ross, Sue Cook, Fiona Bruce, and the late Jill Dando. My guest still ventures into media waters. She had her own crime shows, and you may have seen her covering high-profile cases on Sky News, Daybreak, BBC ITV and Channel 5 News, and BBC Radio 5 Live. She is a guest speaker and a qualified counsellor, specialising in anxiety and depression. My guest has been actively involved in the Levson Inquiry after her life was transformed after the reinvestigation of private investigator Daniel Morgan's murder in 1987. She went on to form the pressure group Hacked Off, where she campaigns for a free, accountable press with standards to protect the public, strengthen democracy, and safeguard freedom of expression. Today, I speak to Jackie Hames about her life and her many guises. We talk about her time as a police detective, the broadcasting world, her memories of Jill Dando, the moment that changed her life, and her views on the Levson Inquiry and the British press. Good evening, Jackie. God, I'm exhausted just it's... listening to all that. <laughs> just one correction, I didn't form Hatch Off. I was one of the early supporters and ended up working on the board. But I'm sure you'll come to that. A very warm welcome. Thanks Thank for you. the Thank you for the correction. <laughs> Fascinating doing the research in preparation for this interview this evening, and there's so much ground to cover, and I'm sure our conversation is going to go in all sorts of directions, but let's go with the obvious and go back to the very beginnings. You were born in 1959. Can, can I ask where you were born, and can you give us an insight into your childhood who your parents are, what they did for a living, and do you have siblings? Yeah, there's a lot in that question, isn't there? <laughs> Thank you for reminding me when I was born. That's, that's always a joy. Um, yes, well, I'm a Londoner. I was born in South West London, around Stratham area, um, and brought up in generally around that area and stayed there, went to school around there. Um, my parents were both in the Navy, Royal Navy. My dad was a career um, naval person, started off as a boy sailor at 16 and worked his way up into being an officer, communications officer. Then he um, retired. Uh, he was a lot older than my mum. And in fact, they didn't meet until after he'd retired from the Navy and he went to work at the, um, at the Foreign Office doing um, codes and ciphers for um, uh, MPs and senior cabinet ministers traveling around the, the world. So he traveled quite a lot. Um, he was the one carrying the bag with the chain on it, you know, carrying around sort of coded messages and things, which he didn't talk a lot about, sadly. But, um, and in fact, he didn't talk a lot about his naval career. He, um, you know, he had a quite a torrid time during the war. Um, uh, they, he was on a, a frigate which used to accompany the, um, um, all the ships taking supplies and things, what they call them, I can't remember the term, but um, they would accompany the um, convoys that would um, support the troops fighting overseas and got sunk, I think, three times. So he had quite a torrid time in the Navy and, um, and very rarely sort of reflected or even mentioned it, which is very sad. Um, but um, I think, you know, he... Um, like a lot of people of that era, just wanted a quiet life. So um, he met my mum and uh, who already had a daughter and um, and they had me. 
And um, she was in the Navy, um, had a fantastic couple of years out in Malta in north of Scotland and various things. And sadly, as was the culture for women at the time, as soon as she um, found out she was having a baby, she had to leave. And um, I think she found that quite difficult um, because she loved it so much. But in the 1950s, as we were talking about, um, that was the life. And she ended up leaving and then going to work in the foreign office where she met my dad. So um, her, she, I think, uh, I inherited her, the sodded gene, where we sort of, we conformed to a degree and then we gave sod it, I'm not standing for this. And so she was a bit of a fighter as well, I think. I think she once walked into the, um, the offices of the day of the, um, the mirror, funnily enough, after with all my contacts now, now or at work around press, she walked in there and asked for a job once and uh, and got one. Um, so she was quite feisty, my mum. Um, sadly, she and my sister had a, my older sister had a, a very difficult relationship. So my dad and I being quite similar, quite introvert, quite shy, we tended to keep on the sidelines and let them get on with all the drama. So my dad and I were quite close. An in, interesting. In, do you want to prompt me another question? An interesting insight already into your family background, and the shyness thing's interesting, and we'll pick up on that a bit later, particularly when you're in front of the the camera later on. But we'll pick up on your broadcasting career. Moving from family origins, I wanted to now talk about education. Where did you go to school, and what are your memories from your time there? And did you have early career ambitions and did you go on to further education? Mm. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one, school. And funny enough, I haven't really thought about it for some time. Um, but sadly, you know, I was very shy, very introverted, low self-confidence, low self-esteem, like a lot of kids starting school. And um, again, the environment didn't really lend itself to sort of drawing you out. Um, uh, I failed my 11 plus so I was kind of written off academically quite early on and there was very low expectations of anything that I might achieve or, or you know could achieve academically so I sort of coasted really which is a bit sad um, I went to a fantastic primary school actually the headmaster was quite inspirational he wrote books and he was he was wonderful actually um, so primary school was good Sadly, I ended up in a huge, I mean, when I say huge, huge comprehensive in Wandsworth, um, which shut shortly after I left as a failing school, but had almost 2,000 girls there. Um, and, you, you know, it's very easy to get lost as someone who's not expected to achieve very much academically and, um, and being a bit quiet and shy. I didn't really get very much. I got a handful of GCEs or... Um, CSEs as they were then um, and I was sort of corralled by my mother into doing um, secretarial work when I ended up working for John Lewis and um, which was lovely actually John Lewis in Oxford Street huge big you know flagship department store which was which was lovely actually I did that for a year I worked in their contract furnishing department and um, but that sod it gene sort of kicked in at one stage and thought I'm really really not going to sit here doing this all day I, and I used to wander off down the store getting bored and tinkering with what other people were doing because I've always although it's a bit sounds a bit uh, counterintuitive but I was although I was shy and quite um uh, an introvert I did like nosing my way around things I like to find out things I was very curious so I always found myself wandering around the store um, chatting to people and asking what they were doing and things so eventually I thought I've really got to do something different I'm not gonna this is not me for the rest of my life so um, I'll never forget the moment actually I can still see myself sitting on the top deck of the number, I think it was the number 49 bus, anyway, whichever one went up to Oxford Street, and um, seeing an advert for police officers. Um, and in, uh, around that time, which was 77, they'd not long had the Equal Pay Act, um, Equal Opportunities Act, so women were being sort of legislated that they should, could, 
be able to do the same jobs as men and were should could be able to go in and uh, be seen as equals and be paid the same and given the same opportunities. And at 18, you think, as I was by then, um, oh, I thought that sounds like a good idea. I'd, be, I'd watched um, Dixon Dot Green. You probably don't remember that. <laughs> um, softly, softly, Juliet Bravo and all those sort of lovely 1960s cop shows, which presented this rather comfortable, um, sanitised view of policing. But And I thought, oh, that looks a bit fun. I quite like the idea of being a Scotland yard detective. Um, so I applied. And at 18, you're incredibly naive about these things. I think actually policing being quite... Um, hermetically sealed, particularly then, in terms of what it was like, the reality of what it was like to be a police officer, other than what you saw on TV. Um, in dramas, there was no reality TV then. Um, I decided to give it a go and um, turned up at Paddington Station for my interview, which was a bit of a shock. Um, uh, but went through the system and I think they probably... <laughs> I had to say limited academic qualifications. Um, so I did have to do tests and things and pass those. Um, and uh, yes, they accepted me, which was a killer shock, but um, just felt like a known adventure. And I think that the, the, I suppose the positive side is, of being kind of written off academically early on is that you just think, oh, well, I'll just do whatever comes along then. And you are less channeled um you know you just because nobody's really taking a lot of interest in you um and you have that curiosity gene you just like I just decided to try something and I tried policing in the 1970s as a woman <laughs> I still can't quite believe I did it but there you go the late 1970s you're 18 years of age and you've mentioned the start of your career in policing and it moves nicely to my next question what preparation and training was required to fulfill that ambition that career and how did you get that break into the police force and what was the first position you actually held well, once you're accepted, everybody starts off or started off then in the same exactly the same way. Everybody, including the commissioner, would have started off as a, a uniform probationary PC constable. Um, we the previously in about I think it was two or three years before, because of those acts of parliament, the women's police department, which separated women from men, was um integrated into the mainstream policing. So that didn't exist anymore. And that was very much women looking after women, you know, and children on doing those sort of jobs, searching women off, uh, women prisoners and things like that. There was no sort of hands-on policing and response type work with the public. So um, yes, I was. You, you start the same way as everybody. You start on the beat as a probationary PC um you're supposed to be given a a sort of a partner an older officer to look after you to puppy walk you as they called it and to show you the ropes I started off in Clapham in southwest London um which was challenging but then again it was an area I vaguely knew having, having been brought up in Streatham which was not that far away um and I found myself as the only woman in a very, very <laughs> male-dominated society, that, um, you know, environment. There were just no other women around, and which actually I found a bit surprising. Um, I thought there might be at least one or two others. But um, uh, the L Division, where I was posted, which was Clapham, Brixton, Kennington and Streatham, um, there could be some days when I'd be the only woman on duty covering all four stations. So I'd be called over to Brixton, for instance, to help them with something there. So in some ways it was challenging because you were trying to become integrated and uh, fit in with a, a very different culture, a very male dominated culture, very um, 
uh, structured, very it had its own language, its own acronyms, um, and very challenging because of the work that was done, never mind the environment. Um, but on the other hand, you're actually, you know, you're very much part of a, a team, a family, a sort of, you know, once you're in, you're seen as part of the part of the team, part of the gang. I wanted to pick up on something that was mentioned earlier, this shyness and, and lack of confidence in it being slightly introverted and, and come back to that. Being in a very male dominated world, do you feel that it kind of gave you more grit, more com- confidence and determination? And maybe ultimately this can do attitude, which we'll pick up on later, where you've done so many things later on in different capacities? Um, yeah, I think it's interesting, isn't it? And I uh, I think at the time, I don't think, I think I just wandered in and tried to fit in really and sort of stayed present in the moment and I think that was really important actually I I didn't really think beyond the end of next week and that's the truth I didn't have a big career plan to become commissioner or anything because I'd been written off academically I was never going to be an achiever so I was kind of just feeling my way through and seeing well let's see where this leads me so there was no big career plan for me Um, I think actually having had quite a challenging childhood what the police service did offer me as an individual was um was that sense of being part of almost a family of being you know people looking out for you and supporting you um and the uniform gives you a sense of belonging and protection i knew that um it would be very unusual for me to be even if I'm out walking at night alone on night duty I knew that if I asked for help half the planet would arrive on my doorstep within two minutes because they looked out for me um some of them were old as old as my father you know they um and I was sort of I mean I actually didn't hit the streets till I was to my 19th birthday where you couldn't go out until you were 19 then so um I you know when I first started patrolling on my own every now and again a police car would drive past as if by magic you know there was a sense of looking after me which was which was actually really endearing I mean there was lots of misogyny don't get me wrong I had the, some real challenges to be taken seriously to be um to give them the same opportunities but um that sense of safety and security which is odd thing to say in such a challenging and um confrontational and risky job i did actually get looked after very well interestingly you say with this profession you feel part of a family that you feel wanted and protected I wanted to ask you, what were your parents' impressions of you working for the the police force? Were they supportive? Were they pleased that you've done that? I just wanted to hear what their perspective was. Oh, yeah. I mean, they were um, really quite impressed, I think, that I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, um, I'd not, I'd actually done something, um, more than was expected of me. You know, my, you know, I, as I say, I was kind of written off as somebody who would bang a typewriter um, for the rest of their life. So the fact that I'd gone off and done that was a sense of pride. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, and in fact, it was interesting, actually. I mean, my dad, uh, was, as I say, he was quite quiet and introverted, but he would he would ask more and my mum wasn't really interested in the details it was all more about telling her friends and the people that I would um that I was in the police and it was a sense of pride for her in that respect. Jackie I wanted to move forward in the timeline because you went on to specialise in major crime investigations how did those opportunities happen And can you also discuss being part of the launch team 
for Crime Stoppers and work in a national crime and operations faculty to identify ser- serial offenders. It's a bit of a leap, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just, a, just, a, just a bit of a leap, yeah. yeah. Well, as you say, I joined in 1977. I went out on patrol at 1978, um, working around that area that I've described. And I suppose the opportunity, and I think what I learned in life was that you you grab opportunities when they come along. And um, in 1981, um, we had, in your far too young, there was a huge, the first, I suppose, major riots in London. Um, there was a resulting report by Lord Scarman afterwards into what happened there, but it was, it, it all kicked off around Brixton and Clapham where I was posted. So it was the most horrendous time um and uh i was um actually seconded onto um the crime squad at the time um and i was doing some helping them out on a murder inquiry when it happened and we had the riots and they set up um specialist units to um do the inquiries into the riots because it was massive arson people seriously injured, um, colleagues seriously injured, and as well as so the fallout was just huge. Um, so as a result, there were very few police officers <laughs> doing a huge amount of work. And I think we went, I went, certainly went through a period of three months without one day off. Uh, but when you're 20, you can do that. You've got the energy. Um, but I ended up um, working on staying on the murder that inquiry that I'd already started on. And then um, because of the short um, shortness of staff, I ended up going over to Brixton and working on a, a murder inquiry there. And I ended up having to have been thrown in the deep end, having to run the office, do house to house inquiries, take statements and ended up, and I found that I thrived. You know, it was something that I just had you know, quite a good talent for organising organizing these things. And um, I think there was about three or four of us running this inquiry, which was unheard of for a stranger attack murder. Um, but I loved it and I found it just found it so interesting, so fascinating. So I sort of decided then that's what I wanted to do because the pathway then into major investigations was to go into the crime squad, to pass a selection board then for detective. Um, I went to Chelsea and um, worked on the crime squad at Chelsea. Then I went on the area burglary squad at Kensington um, and then uh, passed my board as a detective. First posting was in Kingston. And um, uh, where did I go from there? I had a couple of other postings, but, uh, um, uh, you know, to, to um, answer your question, I ended up working at the system there for major inquiries was if you were at Kingston and there was a murder at Kingston, the local CID took it on. So I found myself working on major inquiries a lot because of my experience that I'd built up. Um, and then I... Um, was at Kingston and I saw an advert and in fact somebody I was working with had been sort of headhunted to head up this new unit, Crime Stoppers. And um, I saw the advert and thought, oh, that sounds different. I might just give that a go. It was not something that had been done before. You know, Crime Stoppers as a concept had been done in America, that sense of actively engaging the public um, and publicising crime. Um, in order for them to sort of, ha- you know, directly call a, a single number rather than just contact the local police station um, to give information anonymously if they wanted. I felt that was quite revolutionary and it would cut away a lot of the uh, reticence a lot of the public had about contacting police officers and all that entailed for them. Um, so I went up and we I found myself part of the implementation team and the, the first launching the first Crime Stoppers project, which was in 19, was actually in January 
I think it was the 13th, 1987, I think. 1987, 88. Correct me if I'm wrong. But so, and the first call we took actually was from a young woman who'd whose boyfriend had just committed an armed robbery and had turned up with his friend who also his collaborator and they came back with the weapons um, the money and clothing which they hid in her uh, home and she was absolutely terrified I didn't know what to do um, and called us and luckily my colleague who was just brilliant at talking to people sat with her for an hour on the phone and um, they arrested the whole team recovered everything as a result and the firearms so you know, it was immediate in terms of the impact it was potentially going to have on policing and the, and the relationship with the public and, and changing the, that relationship, which is what I suppose I did later on um, with Crime Watch as well, um, because it was while I was at Crime Stoppers that I saw the advert for Crime Crime Watch, which is when I how I got involved in that. But you wanted to talk about serious crime analysis section which would you like to do first yeah let's let's talk about that first shall we and then that moves timely to the next chapter in your career which is the beginning of your broadcasting career with crime watch which we'll come on to but yeah if we could speak about that as well yeah so i'd um been at Crime uh, Stoppers working at Scotland Yard for a while and um, someone rang me up and said there's an advert gone in. They want um, a woman officer to apply as to work as a presenter just two days a month. And I, um, the thing about Crime, Stop as Crime Stoppers was that we produced a, an advert, a 30 second advert on a regular basis to advertise the telephone number. Um, which was actually produced by um, Shaw Taylor's production team. And he was the person behind Police Five. I don't know if you or anybody's remembered that, but it used to be a five minute program at the weekend. Very simple, um, mainly in, uh, started off in London, but they did it regionally as well. And Shaw Taylor, would, who was an ex-actor, would present and um, talk about unsolved crimes and clues that the public could help with. So it was kind of the precursor to Crime Watch and to um, Crime Stoppers. Uh, so his production team produced the one minute advert for Crime Stoppers. And, and as a result, I met Shaw Taylor and I said, I've seen this advert, would you give me a few hints if I applied for it about what the hell to do, you know, what it would be like? Because I had my sodic gene was engaged again. I thought, well, I'm curious about this. Maybe I should give it a go. And uh, he very kindly invited me when he was filming Police Five. And um, so I sat in front of the camera and, and he was so lovely. I don't know if anyone remembers him, but it, he was um, one of these really huge, tall, larger than life characters who was like a sort of friendly uncle. And he sort of enveloped me in um, care and encouragement and um, said yes go for it just give it a go and see so I just thought of, I'll apply and I was the last um, person to audition on the day of all the auditions and um, and I think by then I'd kind of made up my mind that I probably wasn't going to get the job I think partly because I think they were, I just got the impression they were looking for someone with a more regional accident accent which would be appropriate you know to cover it for a program covering the whole country and they already had David Hatcher who was from Kent so I just kind of thought they're not going to want anybody from the Met so I just went along and I thought I'll have a bit of fun here so I did the audition and um two weeks later <laughs> they said right you're on you know live television in fact they did allow me for the first one to pre-record my bit um because I was absolutely terrified um, but after that, um, the studio director, who was wonderful, um, he um, said, uh, sort of just guided me through it. And I sort of learnt on the job, really, and, and did 16 years later. I was still doing live telly every month. It's hilarious, really. The beginnings of your broadcasting career. Let's now turn the clock back now to 1990. 
when you became a member of the BBC Crime Watch team. How were you presented with that opportunity? Well, I, that's kind of what I've just described, Jane. Yeah. That's, that's the audition I did. And I was on the following two weeks later, I was working on Crime Watch as a presenter. So um, that was that was what I've just described, my entry oh. into to BBC television uh, once a month. Was there any formal training involved whatsoever? Or was it a question of literally just learn on the job pretty much? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. I mean, the team were pretty well oiled. They were a brilliant team and we had some fantastic people on it. Um, and at one stage, actually, um, it was in addition to sort of just the opportunity of being able to do something so different in such a different world and such an you know interesting environment um it was at one point they had an all-female production team which was incredible for me never having worked with another woman which is i know this sounds odd but you know i just didn't didn't have the opportunity to do that so it was wonderful to me to be an environment, to see women really, for the first time, really having ambition and achieving things. So that was amazing. Um, but yes, it was very much a case of um, learning on the job, you know, learning how to um, manage auto queue, to ad lib updates and to work, you know, use the live talk back earpiece um, and things like that. Listen to studio directors and timing and, all the stuff that goes with television, but also actually um, to feel so much more connected in the same way Crime Stoppers did um, with the public. And, re re you know, when we appealed on some really serious, horrendous crimes and to, to be in the studio when a member of the public rang up with some information and you could see on the faces of the detectives there going, this is fantastic, this is it. Um, and to think that you, you know, may have accelerated or even helped, you know, helped actually solve a, ca the, 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 a crime of that magnitude is is incredible to be part of, and it's electric atmosphere in the in the studio. A groundbreaking program to work on, and as you said, it gave police officers the opportunity to maybe solve cases quicker and be given more freedom of information from the public. I wanted to pick up on the team dynamic, uh, the people you work with, because you work with some experienced broadcasters. What did you learn from them and the team behind the cameras, behind the scenes as well? And can you discuss your relationship with your colleagues, both professionally and also uh, away from uh, uh, working on Crime Watch. You mean with police officers, or uh, yeah, and with the um, with the team as well. So the broadcasters, your fellow presenters, uh, the team, the, the team behind uh, the scenes as well, the crew. Mm. Yeah, I mean, there was they. It's a very, it was a very in in engaging team actually, and I think the nature of the work that you're doing is such is. It's a bit like when you're in the police. It's when you're when you've when you're appealing on a case or researching and presenting a case, which is so serious. And most of the cases we did were, particularly the major reconstructions, but also some of the smaller cases which David Hatcher and I used to present. There was, you know, we were looking for somebody who'd raped somebody or committed um, a whole series of armed robberies, for instance there's a real sense of public service. I mean, it was public service broadcasting at its best, but it was also a sense from the individuals, whether they be Nick Ross and Sue Cook and Jill and Fiona and um, the editor production team, um, there was a real sense of we can, we are playing part in, in solving this crime of bringing someone to justice and to, um, to bringing a case to resolution for the victim. And that really, I was, I think I was quite surprised initially at how, how that had um, been absorbed by the production team, how, how motivated they were by that. It wasn't just a job, but, you know, you could tell they were really emotionally invested in the cases. And that makes a huge difference. And um, 
I was fortunate because it was when I joined the, the, the um, program had been going for about four or five years already. So it's quite a well-oiled machine and there was a brilliant team already in place. And they, again, sort of scooped me up and guided me through. I mean, Nick Ross was a fantastic journalist, um, so experienced as a broadcaster, as was Sue Cook. You know, they both done a lot of live television and just to be, you know, to watch them um, and the professionalism and um, understanding of what, how to sort of formulate a script and, and to use a few words to create huge impact um, was, I was just so lucky and so fortunate to be able to be, to work, you know, to work alongside them. On memories of working on Crime Watch, can we now move the clock slightly forward to 1999 in a tragic moment in your life? And I remember where I was when this happened and it struck a particular chord because I'd actually met this person who had interviewed my father back during her radio years at BBC Radio Bristol. And that was the, the murder of Jill Dando on April the 26th, 1999. Can you record, Jackie, where you were when you heard the news of her murder? And what are your recollections of Jill on a professional and personal basis? And how difficult was it to have to investigate the case as part of the Crime Watch programme? Um, where was I? I? Well, I was working at the place you mentioned earlier on. That, um, I'd had my daughter by then, and um, I was um, working as the office manager for the serious crime analysis section, which was a, a unit looking into um, analytical processes for solving uh, unsolved stranger attack, murder, rapes and abductions. So it was quite a, um, it wasn't an immediate sort of frontline policing role, but it had a, a role in um, live investigations as well as historical ones. Um, and yes, I've just literally got a tap on the shoulder from the boss and pulled to one side. And initially we thought that Jill, um, I was told that Jill had been stabbed. And then um, it transpired a short while later that she had in fact been shot. And I mean, you just don't, there's nothing that prepares you. I'd seen a lot of things in my career. Um, and, and I think that detachment, because they're not, it's not personal to you. I mean, it's personal in the sense that you've got to deal with tragedy and serious injury and death, but it's not your family and that's how you deal with it. But to, to somebody that you've known and worked with, um, that was really challenging because it's like a big car crash between personal and professional life, which really knocks you sideways. I mean, it's absolutely... Um, I was really lost for a bit, um, but, you know, you have to crack on. You know, I had a family. Um, I got together with the team at Crime Watch within a day or so, and, um, and I think that's what helps, is having people around you who know exactly how you're feeling in that moment. You don't have to explain it. They all get it immediately. And, and to be with people who, who just need some, you know, that... Uh, unconditional um, support and understanding for what you're going through. I mean, Jill was one of those people who everybody knew um, in the country, particularly, you know, because she'd done, not only was she as an experienced journalist doing the news, um, which was made her well known, she did things like the holiday programme. Yeah, which, of course, yeah, you know, indeed. Completely different type of programme. And she would be smiling and she had that, a lot of charisma a big wonderful big smile and she was tall and you know she'd walked into a room and people knew she was there she was one of those people who made an impact wherever she went and she was incredibly kind and engaging and fun to be around um, and the sadness of it was that she'd you know finally found someone to settle down with and she was just about to get married and the tragedy of that that 
she was just about to, you know, she found someone who could make her happy in her personal life as well as her professional life. Um, and that just, you know, it, just the whole thing was absolutely tragic. And the idea that um, the crossover, obviously, into my professional life as a police officer, you know, knowing that the type of investigation that was being done, I had to keep my distance from that. But the, obviously the team put together an appeal on the first programme back after it happened. I think it was, um, we'd had a programme the week before she was murdered. And then, um, so it was about two or three weeks later that we had the next programme due. And we, um, you know, with obviously the agreement of this investigating officers, we put together an appeal film and um, it was agreed that Nick would present that at the beginning or present a, a you know a sort of tribute to Jill at the beginning um, and I remember that I was the next person on after him doing that to carry on with the rest of the program and uh, I remember walking around the inside of the donut at the television centre that I just couldn't listen to what he was going to say I had to stay absolutely focused and I said to someone just give me a signal a cup you know give me 30 seconds notice for when I've got to start and I walked in afterwards and then just carried on with the rest of the program um but the fact that you're with people you know and that's where the strength and support comes from you know that's how you get through these things um uh otherwise it would have been I think too much for most people but it, again it's that sense of um pulling together to actually solve the crime that sometimes actually at that moment we felt very close to us and we really were motivated to do some whatever we could to help. 20 years on and sadly it still remains um, an unsolved murder case. Before we move on with my next question, do you think there'll be a time where new evidence is presented and eventually the, the case will be solved in time? Oh, um, well, you know, I, I've been, I was in the police officer long enough to know that you don't make predictions about things like that. You know, um, I've always expected the unexpected and dealt with whatever turns up. Um, whenever a case is unsolved, there's always, it's always, uh, an option to reopen it if something new and significant comes to light. And um, if something new and significant comes to light, which would stand up in court, then there's no reason why it still can't be uh, result in a conviction. But, you know, obviously as time goes on, it becomes more limited. The danger comes where people who, who want to sort of create stories or conspiracy theories around what happened because it for various motivations um uh you know there will always be that because of her profile um in the country so there will always be people trying to solve it um but uh you know obviously the chances become statistically less as as time goes on um and it's it's very sad that that there hasn't been that resolution for her friends and family. But um, uh, you know that it is what it is, and it is often you know there are unsolved murders, and some of them will never be solved. You know we're still trying to solve Jack the Ripper, aren't we? Sixteen years working on Crime Watch. Can I ask you what are your overriding memories of working on the program? And are there any cases you're particularly proud of solving? And who have you enjoyed working with the most during your tenure on the programme? Um, it's always difficult with cases because I don't solve them. The team doesn't solve them. They just present the facts on behalf of, you know, the police officers. What the team were brilliant at doing was pulling together films or appeals which um, would engage the public's interest and to get them motivated to ring in with information. That information was then passed to detectives who followed it up. So the 
team didn't solve cases in that respect. What they did was create opportunity and lines of inquiry and what they were absolutely brilliant at. And some of the film directors on it were wonderful and went on to great careers in drama because they were able to create um, uh, an interest in the public in a case that perhaps had passed them by or they hadn't just hadn't come into their awareness. And what they did was they um, not only pieced together a lot of factual information, they created an emotional response in people to, to, um, to make them think twice about or think, you know, I, I do need to pick up the phone. I do need to, to get over this fear of being in, to getting involved and to pick up the phone and give the information. I remember there was a, um, a, a, a girl who was kidnapped uh, called Stephanie Slater and she was held on a small holding and the man who held her um, had tied her up and he put a, a, a bandana across her eyes but she could just see underneath and she um, could describe his weight from him from the waist down. They had quite an unusual walk. She managed to escape, I can't remember all the details now, but she, um, you know, it was a horrendous ordeal, ordeal for her. And we were able to sort of, um, because of the experience of the team at, at looking after victims and um, providing them with a safe place to tell their stories to help solve those crimes, um, she did an interview for an appeal on, on the case. Um, now, watching that appeal were um, the suspect's ex-wife and his son who was grown up and they were in two different locations and they spoke to each other on the phone and discussed whether and recognizing him immediately from this description and um discussing whether they should pick up the phone and i think it's it's very easy for police officers who are engaged in this sort of thing all the time to forget how difficult it is to do that to pick up the phone and say i know something I know it was my father, it was my ex-husband, it was my friend, it was the guy I work with, or it was the woman who um, comes into my shop every week. It's really hard for the public to do that. And to, what the team were able to do was create the motivation in people and the sense of safety and public service to be able to pick up the phone uh, and do that. And, and, and eventually um, this guy's family did call in. I think the son called in the following day and Michael Sams was arrested. And he was also, um, he was convicted of that abduction and, uh, and also the murder of another woman called Julie Dart. And I think that one sticks with me um, because, partly because of her interview, I think it impacted me so much of the fact that she was able to, you know, after all that awful ordeal to come into the studio and to feel safe enough to and trusted enough in the team to look after her to be able to give that interview, which provoked that response from the public. So um, I think moments like that do stay with you because of the people. Jackie, I want to move on to the next chapter in your life story. But when we do, I need to kind of give this um, some context. A very traumatic and tragic part of your your story this evening and that was when your former husband David Cook was involved in reinvestigating the murder private investigator Daniel Morgan uh, the murder in 1987 can you discuss that appeal which was made on crime watch and then the ramifications that resulted from that particular broadcast yeah Okay, um, and obviously I've talked about this a fair amount anyway, but so, so it's on public record. But yes, I um, um, David was asked to front an appeal for this historical murder into the um, uh, the murder of a private investigator called Daniel Morgan in southwest southeast London, um, in back in nineteen eighty seven, I think. Sorry if I've got that wrong. Yeah, it was. It was not, yeah, it was 1987. Um, and um, you know, the passage of time, he'd been. They were reinvestigating. My knowledge was very limited. I wasn't involved in it at all. I just knew that David was. I've been asked to front a crime watch appeal, and in fact, 
happened to be that I was on that program that night, but it you know wasn't connected with me at all. But um, he was uh, asked to make an appeal, uh, asking for anyone with information and offering quite a large reward for anyone to come forward. Um, now, what I didn't know at the time was obviously that they had suspects in the case under surveillance um, to see what sort of reaction this appeal would promote in them, whether they would talk about um, anything to do with connecting with the inquiry and perhaps open up some new lines of inquiry and um, gather evidence. As a result of that um, appearance, um, that investigation team picked up intelligence and information that um, David had been identified by the suspects as, as being the new officer in the case, the person who took on the inquiry. And, um, excuse me, fizzy drinks, and a uh, bit of bad news before I'm into you. Um, and as a result of that, he, um, to paraphrase really, quite a long, complex story, um, uh, it, he and we became a target for the suspects in that inquiry. Um, it is complex. Bizarrely, um, as things played out, um, I had two young children. We had two young children at the time. And um, we were followed by a couple of vans, white vans. Um, uh, and the one turned up at the end of the drive. One followed him taking the children to school and nursery. Um, mail was tampered with. Things were moved in the garden. Um, an email was sent to Crime Watch saying that I was having an affair. Um, there was all sorts of nasty things going on, um, some of which we didn't know about till some years later. But at that stage, that's what we knew about. Um, so we were put under the umbrella of the witness protection scheme and um, allocated a couple of officers. <coughs> and... Um, Basically, um, one of the vans that followed David was stopped. He arranged to have a, a random stop done by some uniform officers. And um, it turned out that the people in that van were actually employed by the News of the World newspaper. Now, the connection ended up that um, Daniel Morgan's business partner, Jonathan Reese, who was one of the suspects, in the murder um, had a relationship with um, a detective at Catford CID, which was the area where this had happened. That detective um, left the force and ended up replacing Daniel as Jonathan's business partner. And they carried on the agency after Daniel's murder. And one of their employment uh, employers, um, was News of the World. So there was a clear link between the two, the, the two organisations and there was an individual that worked in the, in the News of the World who was very close to the suspects in the, in the murder inquiry. So, you know, at the very least, it did look like there was some interference going on. Um, I have to be careful, obviously, because no charges have been brought either for the murder or for that potential allegation of um, perverting the course of justice and interfering with a murder investigation. But clearly there was some link that, that was just extraordinary. Jackie, you went through a tremendous, um, terrible ordeal for many, many years that affected your marriage and you know, it was a, a terrible ordeal on your, your family and you were hanged by the, harassed by the tabloid press, um, which you've spoken about in some depth. But can we talk about 2008? Because you decided to make a change to your life. You decided to leave the mat. How difficult was it to make that change? And can you also summarise how difficult it was to give evidence at the Levson inquiry, but and also go through the breakup of your marriage? In two sentences. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm, I'm 
being a bit sort of glib there because it is, you know, that's a huge, huge chunk. I mean, clearly life had taken its toll on me. I, you know, I, it affected my mental health. I had PTSD. I was struggling a lot working full time, having two children, a husband who was away a lot working. Um, and thing, you know, it, there is only so much you can all take and things start to crack. And I knew I had to do something to um, make life a bit easier. And I tried part time working and it didn't really work for me. So I decided to leave in 2008 and make a fresh start and to try and sort of um, spend more time um, with my children and to put behind me a lot of the challenges that have been that I've been presented with and and in fact things were fine in many respects I you know I tried lots of decided I got my soddy soddit gene sort of working and my curiosity and okay what can I do here and I um, carried on I started working a lot in the media as a sort of on news doing things like um, newspaper reviews and things like that and I carried I did a couple of series for the BBC break in Britain and different things and um started to do more work doing a lot on breakfast tv talking about crime cases and things like that so was, I was getting work in I was I carried on doing some work for the Met as a training media training for senior detectives and also I um I met my old mucker from Crime Watch and we motor booked together Fiona Bruce and I which was great fun about women's personal safety I got involved in some sort of campaigns around stalking and harassment um, which was a, a subject that I felt very strongly about um, so I, I got sort of put my fingers into lots of pies um, but it was in fact um, 2010 when I, I think it was when I finally got uh, the knock on the door from Operation Weeting which was looking into um, allegations around phone hacking and that's when I found out that we had not only had had those surveillance issues and, and mail tampering and all the other stuff going on they were in fact um, potentially um, hacking our phones and, uh, as well um, and that again it sort of stirred everything up and I you know there was a sense of I'm never ever going to be an end to this um, and I think you sink or swim in those situations. You either decide that you're going to be beaten down by it all or you're going to stand up and fight. And that's when I, 2011, I joined up with the initial people who got hacked off, started to campaign for a public inquiry. And I remember going up to Westminster to College Green and signing a petition for a public inquiry. And... Um, Within, I think within two days, they'd announced, they became an announced one. Um, and, uh, you know, some discussion around um, what that inquiry would entail, the three parts of it, uh, the different two or two parts of it, around the three institutions of the um, politicians, the press and the police, and the relationship between the three of them. And it was... I felt very strongly quite early on that it was going to be very difficult for a lot of serving officers to give evidence for various different reasons from the top through to the bottom um, uh, of the service. And that, um, that I, you know, that we had an important story to tell. Um, and my ex-husband, for various reasons, wasn't in a position to do that and didn't really want to, changed his mind. So I ended up representing the family in that inquiry to to highlight what I saw was um, a relationship that at times had become too close and too corrupt. When you go through difficulties in life, whatever they might be, it can change our perspective on the way we maybe see things. And I think age um, certainly is a factor as well but going through all those things and also talking about your long career established career in the police force and you've mentioned the words that you were proud it was like family 
finding things out uh, in terms of things like corruption, officers having close links with the press, things that went on, did it? Or did you almost feel that you lost your faith in those very institutions that you worked for and that you were so proud of being a part of and giving that public service for such a long time? Do you think it changed your perspective a great deal? I suppose, it, yes, it did in a way. I remember when I gave evidence, there was, you know, at Leveson, um, you know, there was a bit of a light bulb moment in terms of, of before, you know, writing my evidence rather than the actual delivering of it. I, um, there was a sense of, of, you know, a veil falling from your eyes and seeing things from a different perspective. It's very difficult when you join such a, a close knit institution at, at 18 and then find yourself, um, whatever, over 30 years later, seeing things from a very different perspective. And that I think most people who um, uh, have, you know, done one job for many, many years, lived in the same place, you know, seen the same people, suddenly taken out of that and, and see it from a completely different perspective. You're going to be shocked by the way other people react and the way maybe you're you know looking back looking back with a different lens but that's not to say I was I wasn't naive I knew there was corruption in the police force of course there was there always will be um I can remember working um at a police in a, in a CID office and turning up one morning and finding the guy who's next to me whose desk had been um raided by um the internal investigations team and he was in a cell downstairs you know it happened and uh uh, I mean, my first week at the, in the police force at, at 9, 18, I was still 18 then, I think, at Clapham, um, £2,000 was stolen out of the safe, you know, <laughs> the chief superintendent's safe. There was corruption and there, you know, it's it was kind of there and rumbling along. Um, um, but it was to a large, I say to a large degree, it was kind of underground. People didn't overtly going, oh, I took a bung from so-and-so yesterday. It was it was going down. And if you chose to look at it and to challenge it, or if you chose to notice, I mean, you noticed, but you, there was no recourse. There was no uh, route to do anything about it. And that was, so, you, you know, as a, 19 year old you know or as a young police officer you were still trying to find your own way of surviving this and to actually know that there were an awful lot of police officers still trying to do a really good job as professionally and with integrity and honesty um you know I was I knew that there were the majority were actually doing a bloody good job in some really, really difficult circumstances because I'd been, been down there in the gutter with them trying to do it. And that's the hardest thing is that the, the corrupt police officers bring down the ones who've given their life and sacrificed a lot to try and do a really good job and died as a result sometimes or been injured. And on the flip side of that coin, I'd like to hear your take on the press, what you've been through and Many of us, I guess, have become quite cynical and maybe apathetic towards certain wings of the the press with the phone hacking scandal, political bias in terms of the political beliefs of the particular newspaper, um, and many, many other things as well. Images being indoctrinated, lies, people, um, people's lives and their um being um, intrinsically followed by the press and in their envision of their privacy. We do, I guess, need a free press, but what would you like to see in terms of change, what's resulted from the Levson inquiry? How would you like to see the behaviour of press standards and what, what would you like to see ultimately? I suppose what I'd like to see is um, a level playing field. I'd like to see proper free speech um, because people like me and you don't have free speech. We don't have um, um, a way of, uh, of getting our voices heard. 
And that's the, the danger when you have a press which marks its own homework. Um, and when you have them in collusion and collaboration with politicians about what the public are told and how much they're told and change what they're told from the truth. And that's the sadness. And this is about democracy. And that, that's what I've gradually supposed so, you know, I've gradually realised over the years that I've been involved and hacked off um, now for the last 10 years or so, um, is that democracy is based on um, the public being told the truth and then voting according to what they want to do about that. But if you're told a bunch of lies constantly because of another agenda or a personal agenda of the politician or the news, the person who owns that newspaper, you're basing your vote on, on, a, on a fallacy. So where, do, you know, people like me who, uh, you know, my family, there was no voice for us. I couldn't go to a newspaper and say the news of the world are interfering with the murder inquiry because nobody would have printed it. They were too scared of Rupert Murdoch. They were too scared of Paul Dacre. These aren't, this aren't, this isn't about, this is about a culture, obviously, and that was created by people like that, where the journalists, good, brilliant journalists were being corrupted into writing, you know, lies, you know, because it, it, it suited the um, agenda, the political agenda of the, people who own the newspaper all I want to see is our journalists set free to have mm. a code of conduct which everybody sticks to of course people like Paul Dacre and, and Rupert Murdoch are entitled to their opinions too I don't agree with them but I absolutely passionately agree that they're entitled to have them and if they want to print a column in their newspaper giving them that's entirely a matter of them what I really get upset about and I think of my children and the future of this country is the relentless lies day in, day out on the front of national newspapers, which skew the public discourse, which skew the information given to the public so that they don't get the full facts. And when they come to vote, they vote according to the will of Paul Dacre and Rupert Murdoch and, and the rest of the non-doms that own our newspapers and the, the megaphone of the press in this country. And, they've, and there's bullying that goes on that stops other publications from telling the truth is just appalling. And I, I don't care who I upset these days because my sodic gene is still in full flow. I don't care anymore. I will still keep fighting for that for as long as I've got breath in my body. I do think it's incredible how a media baron, somebody who doesn't live in this country, has a total control over what we see on television in terms of sports coverage, you know, with, with Sky and having that ownership of, of content and also somebody who pretty much has a say on the outcome of an election and has been a, a hugely influential figure in back in a particular party that leading up to a general election has gone on to win that election and um, then moving from conservative to new labor back in the late 90s 97 was obviously another case in point to that particular um, point of view. Well, and yeah, well, you know, they had to go and kiss the finger, didn't they, down in South Africa or where it was? I can't remember. They all tripped off to, but yes, they had to or kiss the ring, didn't they, to say yes, we are, um, you know, we're going to um, worship at the altar of Murdoch and 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 have that and engage in that Faustian pact. That um, so that he can hold politi our politicians to um, to ransom and not to account, and I think that's the difference. And now uh, you know this cosy relationship which has gone on with our politicians and these um, media barons um, and the manipulation, and because it's fear, isn't it? It's about ruling by fear, um, and 
you can see it on the faces. If you ask any politician about their relationship with Rupert Murdoch, you can see the fear on their faces because they do not want to say anything which can upset their chances of winning the next election, which is why part two of the Leveson inquiry was cancelled because we had um, uh, culture secretary after culture secretary after culture secretary and prime minister after prime minister after prime minister who is in that Faustian pact with newspaper non-doms to make sure that their agendas are the only thing that appear in those newspapers. And, and don't bite the hand that feeds you. Exactly. Why upset the apple cart? Why have? Why worry about, you know, victims of um, press abuse? They don't matter. We're just cannon fodder, you know, lambs to the slaughter. It's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But I'm afraid it does matter, and I'm going to still keep shouting about it. Jackie, we're going to move on slightly to that moment where we ask every single Your Take guest the same quick fire 13 questions to wrap up the interview. But before we do so, we've covered so much ground this evening, many different aspects of your life, your career, and also your points of view and things you're particularly passionate about. But how do you look back at your life and your many careers, including the highs and the lows, and outside of work, what are your interests and hobbies? And can you also share with us your life as a, a mother? And what are your children's perspective on all the things you've done and all the things you've achieved? Well, okay, there's a huge amount in there. <laughs> so I, 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 I think I said very, very early on that I've stayed present. I don't really look back that much. I've started to a bit more, and I think now I'm in my sort of early 60s. Um, I, I, I suppose you do get more reflective. And I also um, did a degree a couple of years ago in, in psychotherapy and become a counsellor and psychotherapist now. And I think that's maybe made me a lot more reflective about my life. Um, but I still think, you know, I think it's about living in the present and and moving forward and still being curious and that's where I want to be um my children are you know at an age where they're finding their own way in the world and um I hope they're not spending too much time looking at what I've done maybe in the future but um you know I I hope that that um they find themselves as individuals and not look at you know trying to do anything that I've done but um, um, and do I look back? I don't look back that much. Maybe I should a bit more, but um, I still feel that like I've got a lot left in me. And I'm more concentrated on the future than I am the past at the moment. Sorry, I didn't really answer some of that, but that's kind of what's come to mind. You answered the, the question perfectly, and it's, it's interesting that you say you're somebody that likes to look forward and not look back at the, the past, but this evening's proved that when you mentioned about your academia and you said, you know, there were struggles with your early academic background and you weren't expected to go on and flourish in your career, it's quite an incredible life story of all the things you've done, different capacities, and you've just done it. You know, the broadcasting, for example, no no degree, you didn't go to art school, it was literally no journalistic background whatsoever. It was literally just being thrust in an environment and this can-do attitude and just get on with it. Yeah, it's been it's been fascinating to listen to. Thank you. Yeah, I think being an 18-year-old in South London, you know, walking the streets, um, is a sink or swim moment. And I think that was probably what has um, set the template for me for, um, and I'm an optimist, I think, as well. And I think that's what helps because you, that sod it gene, just old world, that's just go on with it and do it and see where it takes you. And not being about you too much, it's more about, other people and being curious about other people and that's what's I think 
I think that's what helps get you through challenging times. Jackie Haynes, we're curious to find out a little bit more about you with these final quick fire left? 13 questions. I think, <laughs> oh, I think, no. I think there could be. <laughs> Don't need to think about these in any great detail, but we ask every single Your Take guest these questions. Let's go for it. Here's number one. What is your favourite pastime, Jackie? That is a tricky one. Um, inst- you know, just instantly, um, I just love reading. We spoke about television. We've spoken about your time in broadcasting. We've touched upon the newspapers and the role of the press, but we haven't spoken about cinema. What is your favourite film and why? Oh, hundreds of them. It's usually me, the last one I've seen. <laughs> I think the one that's, um, again, I'd go with whatever jumps into my mind was Don't Look Up. And I think that shows the power of um, a single idea in, you know, engaging everyone who watches it and being able to distill it into into just an amazing piece of cinema. I loved it. I'm a big film fan and you've got me. Remind Don't me, what is, this, what is this film? Don't Look Up, You Must See It. It's on, I think it's on Netflix still. It is Meryl Streep. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a satirical story based on the idea that um, there is a... Um, meteor heading to earth the scientists you know which could cause the destruction of the planet scientists are warning the president Meryl Streep and um Leonardo DiCaprio is the scientist that come to my mind and um I I know the film you mean now yes I've got it suddenly everybody's saying oh um don't look up look over there it's a sign of our times it's a film for our times we go from film now to books, but who would you cite as your favourite novelist? Again, I'm not very good at the, you know, pinning it down because I jump around a lot. I love factual books. Um, and I've read a lot of psychology over the, or psychotherapy and counselling type books recently, which is, um, but I've just picked up The Mirror and the Light, um, um, the third in the trilogy of the Wolf Hall books and I absolutely love those books I could reread them read. I love beautiful writing as, and um, the names of course go out completely out of your head when you put on the spot um, but there are books which you can and I like poetry um, Mary Oliver people like that um, I just enjoy it's it's my escape I like you know, whatever mood I'm in, whatever I'm, whether I'm feeling happy or sad or reflective, there I have a book that I can jump into and curl up into for a while, which feeds my soul. You've done many, many things, but if you could have had a different profession, what would it have been? Do you know, I think I'd love to have been a journalist. But that, I can only say that now because I wouldn't have presumed that I was capable of it many years ago. You've kind of done it already, to be honest, haven't you? <laughs> well, just, enough, just, have, with, just without the qualification. Article, I had some articles published, so I suppose technically you could say that, but I don't consider myself in that um, under that label because I know some wonderful journalists who are fearless and uh, extraordinary, and I would never put myself in that in that. Um, in that uh, in that environment but uh, yeah I'd love the idea of being a war correspondent or something I think it's my taste for adventure and drama that maybe that says that. Jackie who in life would you say has been your greatest inspiration? I saw this question and I was interestingly I, I, I found out I really struggled with that because joining the police as I said I didn't have any role models there weren't any women in the police that I well I that I came across that I came in contact with you there were no senior officers that I held as role models in life you know um 
I've always enjoyed people like, um, uh, I, I suppose some of the female politicians I, I kind of identify with who've sort of hung in there, kept going and had long careers despite of all the challenges. Betty Boothroyd, I'd love to have lunch with her one day. She was, I always think she's extraordinary. Um, so, she would, she would speak, she was Speaker of the House, wouldn't she, for a time? Absolutely, yeah. yeah and she did a very good you know, job. People like Jacinda Ahern, um, who was, oh, my name escapes me, ex Prime Minister of Australia, woman. Um, it's come back to me in a second. Yeah, it's got, like, this escapes me as well, yeah. But, you know, people like that who defy the odd, odds and, um, and just keep going. Um, and there are so many of them and and men as well you know i'm not um i don't i I mean i'm a feminist but i you know i admire and celebrate wonderful men as well um and there are so many and you can take pieces from different people um for different reasons and i suppose that's what i've done because i haven't really had a single person to look up to now this would be interesting do you read a newspaper? And if so, which one? Do you know what? I don't. I used to absolutely love my Sunday mornings with two or three big newspapers. I'd have a tabloid hmm. and a broadsheet and I loved the magazines and it kind of got so tainted for me that I really couldn't enjoy it anymore. And now I get my news kind of on the internet. Um, I do read articles from different newspapers and I try and read a broad selection because I think it's, even if you don't necessarily approve of the publication, I think it's important to try and read other people's perspectives and points of view to make sure that you're checking in with your own um, your own beliefs sometimes and you're not getting carried away or down a rabbit hole. Um, but um, I struggle with um, having loyalty to a newspaper. I mean, I, I do read The Guardian, I read um, sometimes, I read The Times sometimes, but generally I get my news now from, um, uh, uh, you know, general widespread news from Twitter. That's a different subject, isn't it? <laughs> it is indeed, Jackie. Um, let's talk about cuisine next. What would you say is your favourite food? Um, I'd have to say probably Italian. I just love the simplicity and the, you know, the ease of it and the and the passion that goes into it. We now move on to cultural icons. We get all our guests to choose a favourite one. It could maybe be a political figure, someone who's changed history maybe a revolutionary person, maybe a a feminist, someone who stood up for women's rights. Who would you cite as your favourite cultural icon? Um, I mean, there are lots of people over the years that um, for different reasons come to mind, I suppose. I think in terms of who's around today, I think I would have to say Michelle Obama, I think, because she's absolutely to stay true to who she is. And I think it's so easy, isn't it, these days for um, to be skewed by money and by um, the influence that you and the power that you have if you reach the top of your profession and the top of the tree and in your terms of power and influence but you kind of get the feeling with her that no matter what she does and what she gets she still stays true to herself and I think anybody who can do that um has to be an icon a very very good choice we move from Michelle Obama as your cultural icon to favorite curse words what is your favorite (laughs) curse word and why do you know what? I think I decided fairly early on in policing that I wasn't going to swear. 
and I don't really even now. And that's not to say I disapprove of it. And in fact, I advise some of my clients to have a good swear sometimes because it's a fantastic release of emotion and energy and it gets it out of your system. But I don't really because I found working in the police service with people who swear and get angry and aggressive and use swear words in such an aggressive way, in such a brutal way, repelled me. Mm. And I, so I don't swear. You move from swear words now, which you never use, to, fav- <laughs> to favourite place. I'm sure follow- there's somebody can say to me, I remember you swear, and I may well have let the odd one slip, but I will say that. <laughs> A favourite place next or holiday destination when you get some relaxed time? Where would you choose? Um, I think it's back to Italy again. I love the Amalfi Coast and um, that area, that region. It's just stunning, beautiful. Now we move on to music, but who would you say is your favourite musician or artist or band? And what is your favourite album? Um... Again, I'm, you know, I'm not, I've never had sort of one. Yeah, I'm, as, you know, I love, I still love Bruce Springsteen. He'll always be in my heart, I think. Um, Neil Young. I like poets. Um, so uh, uh, I like people who tell stories through music. Um, and I like sort of Joni Mitchell. <laughs> A bit predictable, isn't it? Carol King. Um, but I, I, you know, um, I love is, the police. Uh, Good old Sting. Yeah, yeah they they did some great stuff. Yeah, um, and, but, you know, Dire Straits were just magical for me. ELO, that sort of seventies and eighties era, I suppose, were my biggest era and influences for for music growing up. Now I listen to everything and from classical to anything that I, I enjoy. All, all types of music, really. Some interesting choices. I love the fact that you like songwriters, storytellers, and the boss man I'm particularly fond of and, and seeing him live. And Dire yeah. Straits, so I've got a fondness, and I've actually interviewed a, a couple of the members. Have um, you? They've done interviews on the, the channel. But that aside, what would you cite as your favourite album? Is there one you go back to and listen time and time again and maybe highlights a specific joyful time in your life um i think it's the police actually i think in the 80s i remember seeing them on i think it was tooting bet common live and um and some of their songs you know everything she does little thing she does is magic and you know it's just such fun music but it feels um intelligent as well and and you know tells again tells a story sting definitely had a knack for writing great catchy pop songs and i still think every breath you take yeah. is pretty much the perfect pop song yeah it's just and, t- timeless yeah and you know and he kept on you know things like fields of gold he kept on doing it didn't he and as a, as a solo artist it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a touch of magic isn't it on the each last- song the last two now, Jackie Haynes. First one, what would you say is your greatest achievement to date? Um, bringing up two children who are still relatively well adjusted. And lastly, Jackie Haynes, how do you wish That's to quite be intimidating remembered? <laughs> it's the voice. Um, how do you wish to be remembered? Uh, for my sod it, Jean, I think. She just kept going and saying sod it. I'm just going to keep going. The sod it genes come out many times this evening. I thank you very kindly for taking the time out of your evening for the last 90 minutes and sharing your oh life God, story. Is that how <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. And it, yeah. It's been a, a long one. It's been insightful. It's been very interesting. Um, the final chapter tonight, but not the, the final ultimate chapter in your life. So I wish you all the very best with all the things you've been doing, the, the news appearances, your commentary on, on television and in the radio as well. And your fight also for, uh, you know, 
to, you know, which you mentioned, your plight for the press to have more integrity and be able to speak the truth and, you know, which has been interesting and you've spoken about in this evening's uh, interview. So I wish you all the very best and thank you kindly again for being a guest on your take. Thank you, James. Good night.